The Berlin blockade was one of the first major international crises of the Cold War. During the multinational occupation of post-World War II Germany, the Soviet Union blocked the Western Allies railway, road, and canal access to the sectors of Berlin under Western control. The Soviets offered to drop the blockade if the Western Allies withdrew the newly introduced Deutschmark from West Berlin. In response, the Western Allies organized the Berlin Airlift to carry supplies to the people of West Berlin, a difficult feat given the city's population. Air crews from the United States Air Force, the British Royal Air Force, the Royal Canadian Air Force, the Royal Australian Air Force, the Royal New Zealand Air Force, and the South African Air Force flew over 200,000 flights in one year providing to the West Berliners up to 8,893 tons of necessities each day, such as fuel and food. The Soviets did not disrupt the airlift for fear this might lead to open conflict. By the spring of 1949, the airlift was clearly succeeding, and by April it was delivering more cargo than had previously been transported into the city by rail. On 12 May 1949, the USSR lifted the blockade of West Berlin. The Berlin blockade served to highlight the competing ideological and economic visions for post-war Europe, post-war division of Germany. From 17 July to 2 August 1945, the victorious Allied powers reached the Potsdam Agreement on the fate of post-war Europe, calling for the division of defeated Germany into four temporary occupation zones. These zones were located roughly around the current locations of the Allied armies. Also divided into occupation zones, Berlin was located 100 miles inside Soviet-controlled eastern Germany. The United States, United Kingdom, and France controlled western portions of the city, while Soviet troops controlled the eastern sector, the Soviet zone and the Allies' rights of access to Berlin in the eastern zone. The Soviet authorities forcibly unified the Communist Party of Germany and Social Democratic Party in the Socialist Unity Party, claiming at the time that it would not have a Marxist-Leninist or Soviet orientation. The said leaders then called for the establishment of an anti-fascist democratic regime, a parliamentary democratic republic, while the Soviet military administration suppressed all other political activities. Factories, equipment, technicians, managers and skilled personnel were removed to the Soviet Union. In a June 1945 meeting, Stalin informed German communist leaders that he expected to slowly undermine the British position within their occupation zone, that the United States would withdraw within a year or two and that nothing would then stand in the way of a united Germany under communist control within the Soviet orbit. Stalin and other leaders told visiting Bulgarian and Yugoslavian delegations in early 1946 that Germany must be both Soviet and communist. A further factor contributing to the blockade was that there had never been a formal agreement guaranteeing rail and road access to Berlin through the Soviet zone. At the end of the war, Western leaders had relied on Soviet goodwill to provide them with a tacit right to such access. At that time, the Western Allies assumed that the Soviets' refusal to grant any cargo access other than one rail line, limited to 10 trains per day, was temporary, but the Soviets refused expansion to the various additional routes that were later proposed. The Soviets also granted only three air corridors for access to Berlin from Hamburg, Buckerberg and Frankfurt. In 1946 the Soviets stopped delivering agricultural goods from their zone in eastern Germany, and the American commander, Lucius D. Clay, responded by stopping shipments of dismantled industries from western Germany to the Soviet Union. In response, the Soviets started a public relations campaign against American policy and began to obstruct the administrative work of all four zones of occupation. Until the blockade began in 1948, the Truman administration had not decided whether American forces should remain in West Berlin after the establishment of a West German government, planned for 1949.
The focus on Berlin and the elections of 1946 Berlin quickly became the focal point of both US and Soviet efforts to realign Europe to their respective visions. As Soviet Foreign Minister Vyacheslav Molotov noted, what happens to Berlin, happens to Germany, what happens to Germany, happens to Europe. Berlin had suffered enormous damage. Its pre-war population of 4.3 million proposal was reduced to 2.8 million. After harsh treatment, forced emigration, political repression and the particularly hard winter of 1945-1946, Germans in the Soviet control zone were hostile to Soviet endeavors. Local elections in 1946 resulted in a massive anti-communist protest vote, especially in the Soviet sector of Berlin. Berlin's citizens overwhelmingly elected non-communist members to its city council. Political division moves towards a West German state meanwhile to coordinate the economies of the British and United States occupation zones. These were combined into what was referred to as the Bizone. Representatives of these three governments, along with the Benelux nations, met twice in London in the first half of 1948 to discuss the future of Germany, going ahead despite Soviet threats to ignore any decisions taken. In response to the announcement of the first of these meetings, in late January 1948, the Soviets began stopping British and American trains to Berlin to check passenger identities. As outlined in an announcement on 7 March 1948, all of the governments present approved the extension of the Marshall Plan to Germany, finalized the economic merger of the Western occupation zones in Germany and agreed upon the establishment of a federal system of government for them. After the 9th of March meeting between Stalin and his military advisers, a secret memorandum was sent to Molotov on the 12th of March 1948, outlining a plan to force the policy of the Western Allies into line with the wishes of the Soviet government by regulating access to Berlin. The Allied Control Council met for the last time on 20 March 1948, when Vasily Sokolovsky demanded to know the outcome of the London Conference and, on being told by negotiators that they had not yet heard the final results from their governments, he said, I see no sense in continuing this meeting, and I declare it adjourned. The entire Soviet delegation rose and walked out. Truman later noted, for most of Germany, this act merely formalized what had been an obvious fact for some time, namely, that the four-power control machinery had become unworkable. For the city of Berlin, however, this was the curtain raiser for a major crisis, the April crisis and the little airlift on 25 March 1948. The Soviets issued orders restricting Western military and passenger traffic between the American, British and French occupation zones and Berlin. These new measures began on 1 April along with an announcement that no cargo could leave Berlin by rail without the permission of the Soviet commander. Each train and truck was to be searched by the Soviet authorities. On 2 April, General Clay ordered a halt to all military trains and required that supplies to the military garrison be transported by air, in what was dubbed the Little Lift. The Soviets seized their restrictions on Allied military trains on 10 April 1948, but continued periodically to interrupt rail and road traffic during the next 75 days while the United States continued supplying its military forces by using cargo aircraft. Some 20 flights a day continued through June, building up stocks of food against future Soviet actions, so that by the time the blockade began at the end of June, at least 18 days, supply per major food type, and in some types, much more, had been stockpiled that provided time to build up the ensuing airloft. At the same time, Soviet military aircraft began to violate West Berlin airspace and would harass, or what the military called, buzz, 
Flights in and out of West Berlin. On 5 April, a Soviet Air Force Yakovlev Yak-3 fighter collided with a British European Airways Vickers Viking 1B airliner near Rathgatau airfield, killing all aboard both aircraft. The Gatau air disaster exacerbated tensions between the Soviets and the other Allied powers. Internal Soviet reports in April stated that our control and restrictive measures have dealt a strong blow to the prestige of the Americans and British in Germany, and that the Americans have admitted that the idea of an airlift would be too expensive. On 9 April, Soviet officials demanded that American military personnel maintaining communication equipment in the eastern zone must withdraw, thus preventing the use of navigation beacons to mark air routes. On 20 April, the Soviets demanded that all barges obtain clearance before entering the Soviet zone. The currency crisis creation of an economically stable Western Germany required reform of the unstable Reichsmark German currency introduced after the 1920s German inflation. The Soviets had debased the Reichsmark by excessive printing, resulting in Germans using cigarettes as a de facto currency or for bartering. The Soviets opposed Western plans for a reform. They interpreted this new currency as an unjustified, unilateral decision. They responded by cutting all land links between West Berlin and West Germany. The Soviets believed that the only currency that should be allowed to circulate was the currency that they issued themselves. In February 1948, the Americans and British had proposed to the ACC that a new German currency be created, replacing the over-circulated and devalued Reichsmark. The Soviets refused to accept this proposal, hoping to continue the German recession, in keeping with their policy of a weak Germany. Anticipating the introduction of a new currency by the other countries in the non-Soviet zones, the Soviet Union in May 1948 directed its military to introduce its own new currency and to permit only the Soviet currency to be used in their sector of Berlin. If the other countries brought in a different currency there, on 18 June the United States, Britain and France announced that on 21 June the Deutsche Mark would be introduced, but the Soviets refused to permit its use as legal tender in Berlin. The Allies had already transported 250 million Deutsche Marks into the city and it quickly became the standard currency in all four sectors. This new currency, along with the Marshall Plan that backed it, appeared to have the potential to revitalize Germany, even against the wishes of the Soviets. Further, the introduction of the currency into Western Berlin threatened to create a bastion of Western economic resurgence deep within the Soviet zone. Stalin considered this a provocation and now wanted the West completely out of Berlin.